Grateful so much. So uh, my job, Chief Preparator, you might not be familiar with the role. It's kind of a made-up job title, made-up word, Preparator. Um, so my job really has two parts. The first part is to go out into the field, find fossils, either prospecting for new localities or going back to old localities that we found, found in years past. And the other half of my job is once those fossils are back at the Denver Museum, uh, working in the lab to get them clean, repaired, stabilized, so they can be used for education, exhibition, research. Um, and so I thought today it would be really fun to compare and contrast the different ways in which we go out and collect fossils, and also some ways uh, in which the fossils kind of find their way to us. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, kind of, you know, 101, you want to go dig up a dinosaur, the first thing you might do is look at a geologic map of the area that you want to dig up. So the lovely state of Utah, since this is DinoFest, um, I thought it was appropriate to look at all the different rocks on here that are from the age of the dinosaurs, so the Mesozoic era. And what's really great, all the different colors on this map represent the rocks that are exposed in different periods of time. If we look at rocks from the Mesozoic era on this map, it's all these different shades of green. And what's really great for us in the state of Utah is that there's a lot of green on this map. Lots of potential to find dinosaurs. Something else you have to think about when you want to go looking for fossils, if they're uh, you know, exposed or the right age, but if the ground cover or the landscape looks like this, it's going to be really hard to find anything. So rather than an environment like this, we want the landscape to look a lot more like this. Uh, you can see the little person down there in the top of the knife bridge for scale. This is an area called Grand Staircase. We run a big field program out here uh, every single year. All the rocks, kind of the tan, green, gray color in the foreground, those are from the Kaparowitz Formation. It's about 75 million years old. And this is just meters, hundreds of meters of rock exposed, uh, again, that have the potential to hold dinosaur fossils. We also want to think about, are the rocks that we want to find fossils in the right type of rock? So if a dinosaur dies next to this volcano, the volcano erupts, you're not going to have any evidence that that dinosaur was ever walking around next to the volcano. It's going to become lava, essentially. Um, so we don't want to look at igneous rocks. We think back to our geology class. Uh, also metamorphic rocks, not only are they oftentimes way too old to have any kind of dinosaur fossil in them, uh, if we remember back to our geology class, metamorphic rocks form from heat and pressure, and so anything that would have died in there would have been altered uh, by different uh, heat and pressure over time. So we're not super interested in igneous or metamorphic. Uh, there are exceptions to this rule, of course, so you know we can have things like volcanic ash preserve fossils really, really well. If you've heard of ash fall fossil beds out in Nebraska, it's this amazing area about 10 to 15 million years old. All of these rhinos and camels that were living in North America at the time became asphyxiated by ash, died, and were then later buried by the same ash from the eruption from the volcano. So of course, there's exceptions to every rule. But for the most part, we're looking for rocks that look like this. So if you've driven around down in southern Utah, you know, outside of Moab, you have these beautiful layers of sandstones and siltstones. These are all from sedimentary rocks, so they're made of pieces and parts of other rocks that have been kind of consolidated or solidified over time. These are the rocks that we look in to find fossils. So if you go to on our checklist, they have to be rocks of the right age, rocks that are exposed, not a lot of ground cover, and rocks that are sedimentary in nature. But sometimes when we go looking for fossils, it's even hard to get to the fossils. So if, uh, when I was working at the Natural History Museum of Utah with Randy and folks here, we worked at a quarry called the Dystrophius Quarry, and just getting to these fossils, we had to set up a series of rock climbing equipment just to get up to where the bones were coming out of the hillside. Uh, sometimes even <laughs> when we're out in the field, we're exposed to nature, all the different elements of nature. So this is a flash flood. You can see the sky is blue. It's a beautiful day. Um, but there was a huge thunderstorm that had come through camp just hours beforehand. And um, it's kind of tricky to see, but um, up here there's actually a little road, and our camp is just at the top of the road over there. So uh, we had to actually sleep overnight in the truck and wait for the water to die down uh, from the storm. So we were out of camp for like 12 hours or something. Um, you know, hail, hail storms. This is from Wyoming in July. You know, these little things were coming through our kitchen tent like little meteors. Um, something that I've had to recently add to my weather CV is this. Um, this is a sandstorm. So we were doing field work down in New Mexico in the San Juan Basin, and this was similar to what I imagine it's like to walk across the Sahara Desert where you're just having sand blasted in your eyes and your nose, and you don't want to keep your mouth open when you're walking around. It was just, it was a mess. Um, you know, snowstorms, this is uh, June in New Mexico, <laughs> you know, don't expect things like that. And then sometimes even just the sheer remoteness of where fossils are located can make them very difficult to access. So this is that same area that the sandstorm was in, where the cluster of clouds is on the side of the screen there, that's where our site is, where the fossils are coming out of. We were collecting 
turtles and dinosaurs and you know all kinds of vertebrates. But if you imagine trying to drive a truck across this landscape of really soft sand, it's super difficult to get to. Uh, Grand Staircase, that area I mentioned earlier down in southern Utah, also really difficult to access just because the terrain is so intense. We're walking across you know, huge knife ridges, we're out in the middle of nowhere, you can't really drive a truck down into the bottom of this super deep basin. And so if we, we know that this area is super fossil rich, we want to go out there and collect all of these incredible fossils, but we have to think of a way to get out there. And one of the ways that we've done that and kind of conquered that over the years is to use the help of helicopters. So what you see on this slide is everything that you need to keep a 12-person crew alive in the backcountry for six to eight weeks at a time. So we pack up everything uh, into these different helicopter nets. So that's equipment and gear and coolers and water and everything that you need to dig up a dinosaur. And the helicopter comes, picks up all of the gear, and you watch it fly away into the backcountry, and you hope that it gets to where it needs to go. Um, this is challenging in and of itself, because if you give a helicopter pilot GPS coordinates, and you know a GPS typically has an error of about plus or minus you know, three to five meters, and the difference of three to five meters when you're out in a place like Grand Staircase is one side of the knife ridge or the other. So there have been moments where I have had to go out prospecting to find my camp gear um, that was dropped you know, in the right location, but um, just that little margin of error made it really challenging. So if you can get all your gear out there, that's one thing to check off the list, but then you also have to think about how do you get your crew and your people into the backcountry. And the easiest thing would be to just shove them in the helicopter with the gear, but oftentimes the helicopter has weight restrictions, uh, or you can only fit one additional person. So if you have a crew of 15 people, that's a, lot of, that's a very expensive way to get into the backcountry. So oftentimes we have to drive ourselves into these areas, and you know, we're not driving across, down a highway, right? These are unmaintained backcountry roads. And so a lot of the weather elements and things that we experience you know, on foot when we're out prospecting are the same things we think about when we're driving a truck into the backcountry. So this is, you can see where the road used to connect behind this person to the other side of the road, and the road is now gone. <laughs> so we have to get creative and find a new way to get into the field site. Uh, always run into lots of local wildlife, some is fuzzy, some is scaly, um, some is very cute. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm driving the cars. <laughs> You can find me and I can give you guys all examples of all of these things until the cows come home. But, um, you know, all of, all of these things were going across my dashboard at one time and I was driving out. Uh, I had a field site down in southern Utah, so, you know, and then, <laughs> I think, uh, well, Carrie's in here. Carrie was here with me when that happened. You know, you're driving on these backcountry roads and it looks like the road is maintained. You can drive across it. It's sturdy enough. We actually drove out of this, if you guys can believe that. We threw a bunch of rocks and sticks and everything into the trench and, we drove away. Um, and this picture I just love, <laughs> so this is my intern, and everybody always has one spare tire, nobody ever has two. So we have both, both flats in the trailer, we had to get that towed out of there. Anyways, all of these things that I share with you, you know, 96% of the time everything is just fine. So we get all of our gear in the, to the right place, we get all the people in just fine. This is what you see as your gear showing up to camp, and you're like, thank goodness, everything made it. You start to unpack all the stuff that got dropped off in the right place and you set up your camp. So at Denver camp, this is what the field looks like. Uh, the big white tent is our kitchen tent, which holds all of our dry goods. We have you know, tables and chairs in there is kind of a you know, nice reprieve if we have, when we have bad weather. Uh, and then the smaller tent is for gear, plaster, things that can't really get wet. Um, and you know, just the camp dynamics and learning how to run field crews and working with everyone. You know, we're like a big family out in the field. Everybody works together to make meals and find fossils. And it's a great dynamic. But so you set up your camp and then you go out and you look for fossils. And a lot of times you find things that look like this. This is a chunk of a turtle. <laughs> and if you've uh, ever been out walking around in southern Utah, you've probably kicked these off the front of your boot, maybe not even knowing it, but you see these chunks everywhere. We don't get super excited about things like this. Oh, I don't get super excited about things like this. Some people might. Um, oftentimes when you're out looking for fossils, it's things that look a lot more like this. So these are chips and chunks of fossil bone that are laying there, which is a good sign. You want to try and hike up the hill find where the fossils are coming from. If it's an isolated element, this is a quadrate from a triceratops, or jaw joint from a triceratops. And you can just kind of pop that little guy out of the ground, throw it in your pack, and keep prospecting. A lot of times you'll be out hiking around and you'll find things like this. And this is what we call a microsite. And what's really cool about this is in just one handful that's on the screen here, there's about five or six different animals represented in just this one handful. And so even though they're not the super crazy charismatic T-Rex fossils that everybody wants to find, it kills me to say this, but microsites are just as important as the big giant dinosaurs because it tells you so much about the ecosystem and what was walking around alongside the dinosaurs at the time. 
So a lot of times paleontology looks like this. It's a lot of time spent on your belly and picking up tiny little fossils when you're finding a microsite. But everybody, this is what everybody wants to find, right? So this is the um, shin bone, so the tibia and the fibula from a long-necked dinosaur. Um, but you want to see, you know, if you're hiking up and see something like this sticking out of the ground, you find that the shin bone's connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone, so on and so forth. That means you have part of a dinosaur skeleton. It's time to open up a quarry. So when you're doing this in the backcountry, if you're prospecting seven miles away from camp and you find a dinosaur skeleton seven miles away from camp, that means everything you need to get that fossil out of the ground is going on your back and then you're hiking it out into where this fossil is coming out. And as much as it hate, I hate to burst anyone's bubble, 85% um, of paleontology is just doing manual labor. So you're using picks and shovels, you're removing tons and tons of overburden, um, and then once you get down to the bone layer, you know, about six inches above where the fossils are coming out, you can switch over to more delicate tools for delicate, or, you know, more delicate bones. So things you see in this picture, whisks and awls and brushes. Um, but sometimes, you know, the rock is not super soft that you're working in. <laughs> almost, it never is, almost. <laughs> so you have to switch over to crack hammers and chisels. If those don't work, then we have to hike out the gas-powered concrete saw. And then sometimes you also have to use a jackhammer to get through some super-duper hard rock um, <laughs> to get the fossils out. Everything that we take out of the ground gets mapped into the place that it came from before we remove it from the context that it was in uh, forever. Once the fossil's out from the quarry, you can never really put it back exactly as it was. So what you see here are folks using a meter grid square, and it's divided up into 10 centimeter increments. And you can see on the paper that Mike has there on the bottom of the screen, he's mapping on the same exact you know, surface or kind of the scale that the meter grid is at. And what's really cool is you can then compile all of the meters together to make a really beautiful quarry map to make observations and inferences about what was going on in the quarry at the time. Okay, so you found the dinosaur, you know you, know you need to get it out of the ground, what's next? How do you do that? So if you see all these tiny little, looks like a line of sticks, right, that's on the screen right now, those are all of the neural spines from a Parasaurolophus. And rather than plucking each of these individual vertebrae off of the dinosaur skeleton and collecting them one at a time in my backpack, I'm going to collect this as one big giant block so that I can keep all these bones together. So you start to trench around the block, and then once the kind of block is isolated or you've broken the skeleton up into manageable size chunks, um, you then start to cover it in paper towel as a separator and then pieces of burlap that are dunked in plaster. And you repeat this process over and over and over again until you get five or six layers of burlap all over what, the fossil, the part of the dinosaur. And you do this again throughout the entire quarry so that you end up with all of these different white blobs uh, that are different chunks of the dinosaur skeleton. You then start to undercut the underside of the jacket. And just when it's getting really scary and you can tip it over, um, you crack through the mushroom stem. So as you're pedestaling in, you now have a jacket in the shape of a mushroom. You crack the mushroom stem, you get everybody on your crew that's feeling spry, and you say, one, two, three, we're gonna push over this 2,000 pound jacket, and that's what you do. You flip it over, you expose the raw rock on the bottom side, and you repeat the process all over again, and plaster and burlap and plaster and burlap. So if the jacket weighs about 100 pounds or less, sometimes you can throw it in your backpack and hike it out of camp. If the jacket weighs a few hundred pounds, you often use a bodyboard, like what you would use if somebody was you know, hurt in the backcountry. You get a team of folks around and you all take turns carrying it back to camp. You know, this can be sketchy in and of itself if you're working in areas that have knife ridges and so on. Um, but you load it up in the back of the truck, drive it back to the museum. And then if you have a big giant dinosaur skeleton, you know, it's not going to weigh just a few hundred pounds. Oftentimes these field jackets weigh thousands of pounds. And in that case, we have to rely on the help of a helicopter again. And, um, you know, I was telling some folks this story last night. So we actually will go and flip these fossils into helicopter nets. And if we run into bad weather or, you know, we can't get back out to the site right away, this might have to sit out in the back country for like a year. And we had one of our sites, this one in particular, it's a spot called Uncle Charlie's Bone Bed. It's a huge skeleton from a horned dinosaur. It weighed over 4,000 pounds. We collected it in this one giant block, but a pack rat had built its nest in there and chewed through the entire helicopter net. So as we get the helicopter out there to try and lift the fossil of the ground, it's just going to go plunk and hit the ground. So we actually ended up buying toe straps at the hardware store and fastening toe straps around it, and it you know, got out okay. Um, got back, we found a way to get it back to the museum. But the helicopter comes, picks up your field jacket, plops it in the back of your field truck that's sitting at the staging area, and then we drive it back to the museum. So that's the way in which we do remote backcountry work. Um, but what's really cool about living in the American West, you know, Salt Lake City, Denver, so on and so forth, we're right in the middle of some of the greatest exposures of Mesozo Mesozoic rocks that we have in the world. 
and especially in the state of Colorado, and particularly in Denver, um, if we look at our geologic map again, all of the cool colors that are on this map are all from the latest Cretaceous, and they all hold the potential to have dinosaur fossils in them. And uh, that's exactly what has happened <laughs> over the past few years. We've had some pretty cool finds um, in two areas that are about 20 minutes north of Denver and 20 minutes south of Denver. And the red line that's on here too, I should mention, is the KT boundary, so that moment in time that records when all the dinosaurs go extinct. And so the city of Denver is right in the middle of all of that, which is exciting. And driving around Salt Lake, I noticed that it looks a lot like Denver, where everything is under construction all of the time, um, which is great news for a paleontologist because it means a lot of things are getting dug out of the ground. So since I've been at the museum, I've had the opportunity to work on a number of these types of sites where we get called out and they say, well, mostly I get called into the foreman's office and he has a black garbage bag and it's full of chunks of bone. <laughs> we are like, I think we hit something. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, oftentimes things will look like this. This is a cross section of a bunch of ribs from a horned dinosaur. Uh, you know, and every time we get called out to these sites, we start to think about what kind of fossils have been found in Denver over the past, you know, 100 or 150 years or so. So the first triceratops ever was found in the Denver area back in 1887. Um, when they were building out the suburbs of Denver in the 90s, you know, they were getting calls at the museum that people were finding T-Rex legs in their backyards and they were digging out foundations for houses and things. If any of you are baseball fans, you'll know that our mascot is Dinger, <laughs> the Triceratops. Um, and when they were building the Rocky Stadium, they bumped into dinosaur fossils during that process. When they were paving the runways out of the airport, they were pulling out giant palm fronds. Uh, so Denver, you know, even though it's a huge metropolitan area, it's incredibly fossil rich. So back in 2017, uh, we got a call similar to, you know, just like all the other construction calls come out, I think we hit something. And I get out to the site and on uh, the bottom of the screen here, this is the brow horn that they had hit with the bulldozer. And this is the scapula right next to it. Um, so we were out at that site for a number of weeks and it turned out to be the most complete torosaurus skull and skeleton that's ever been uncovered. Just in metropolitan Denver, <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, we recovered about 97% of the dinosaur skull and about 30% of the skeleton. Um, just a quick aside, Torosaurus and Triceratops, two different critters, so the biggest difference being one has a huge set of holes in its frill, the other one has a solid frill. So Torosaurus, this guy in the bottom, was the one that we found back in 2017. In 2019, we get a similar call. I go out to the site, that was that first picture I showed you guys that had the cross section of the ribs coming out. and. Um, same thing, we hit a, a Taurosaurus skeleton out at this locality too. And it's not just chips and chunks of bones, like these are huge giant dinosaur bones that are sitting next to huge pylons that they're building um, out at a, this was at a senior living facility that they were building a huge condominium complex for. So we spent about seven weeks out at the site. Um, we run this the same exact way that we run our field crews in the back country. We call out a bunch of our volunteers. We, you know, jacket everything, flip everything, carry everything out. The nicest part about working at a construction site, though, is that you don't have to carry a single thing. <laughs> we are surrounded by heavy equipment constantly, which is so nice. So you can use the guy driving the bulldozer. Him and I are pretty good buddies. Um, so <laughs> they load these field jackets up in the back of the field truck, and then it's super easy to just pop up the road to Denver, and you get to take a shower at night. So <laughs> it's a win for everybody. <laughs> Um, when we get back to the museum, you know, we use a big forklift to unload all these field jackets, and depending on where these things lie on our priority list for research, we'll either um, put them in our jacket storage facility area, which is what you see here, second floor of the museum. It's right above our CEO's office, which is kind of crazy. Um, or we'll crack open the jackets right then and there to get them um, to start working on them. So we open them up with a big angle grinder, expose the fossils that are inside, and we get to work. Uh, these are two of my interns from the prep lab back in 2021. We use a series of tools that look like this. Some of these things uh, you probably have at your house. Hopefully you have a toothbrush at your house. Um, <laughs> we use a series of different kinds of glues to keep all the fossils held together. Um, if you've never seen, so this glue is a temporary reversible glue, um, and it's in liquid form in this picture. It's in these little bottles, but it starts off with these plastic beads dissolved in acetone or nail polish remover. And as you apply this onto the surface of the bone, the bone sucks it up like a sponge and the acetone evaporates. So it leaves the plastic behind impregnating the fossil um, and makes it stronger, essentially plasticize it so that you can work on these super old fossils. Um, also, if you ever want to get a prepared or riled up, you can really talk about glue and it gets a lot of people fired. <laughs> Lots of fighting about glue and fossil prep. <laughs> 
Once the fossils are all done, they go down to our collection, or they um, place in these really nice archival cradles. The person that I work with, Salvador Bastian, he's an expert cradle maker. Um, these big support structures are made out of felt and fiberglass. Um, also, every single fossil that we collect at the museum gets assigned a number. And this number that's written in Sharpie on the jacket here stays with the fossil its entire journey. So the moment that it's taken out of the field to the moment that it goes down into our collection space and entered in the database, this tiny little green tag holds all of the keys of the castle in terms of where it was collected, who collected it, what it is, where it came from, so on and so forth. So, you know, really important to <laughs> keep track of all of this when we're opening jackets. Um, so all these fossils go down to our collections facility, and then they're available for researchers around the world to use. Um, we, you know, share them with other uh, other folks at the museum for education and you know research, so on and so forth. But I share all of these things with you. I feel like, you know, I share these giant hailstones and you know sandstorms and all of that. And it's not to deter anyone in this room from doing field work. Um, it's really just an awesome, awesome experience to be able to contribute to really cool bodies of research. So like these are some of the incredible fossils in this building here that were unknown to science before folks were able to go out in the back country and deal with all the elements and collect all of these things. Um, same is true, you know, we could roll our eyes at every phone call we get every week that somebody bumped into something at a construction site, but being out at these sites led us to find really incredible fossils like the this beautiful Taurosaurus skeleton. Um, and I guess the last, one of the last things I'll say is, you know, it's so wonderful to be able to train kind of these next generation of paleontologists and all of the logistics involved in managing a big crew in the back country. How do you work alongside a bulldozer and make sure that the operator is not chundering through a rib cage? Um, and these are all really great teaching tools for you know, interns and students and being able to share all of this with the public. It's really great. So one of the last things that I will leave you with is um, just a couple months ago, we got another call that somebody found something on a hiking trail. Um, this has been in the news lately, and I feel confident that we'll be back out at the site once all the snow melts to see what's going on, what kind of fossils we can uncover from one of these calls. So with that, I want to you know, thank all the folks that help us be able to uh, you know, do all this amazing field work and collect all these amazing fossils, and thanks to NHME for having us. And also, the last thing I will say is that paleontology is not a solo sport. Paleontology requires huge crews of people, and that means interns, that means volunteers, that's staff, um, and there's no way that we could collect any of these things that we do if we had to do it by ourselves. So huge thank you to the volunteers and everyone that I get to work with every day. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have. Also, one last thing to say. Thank you for coming to We're always looking for interns at our museum too, so please, if you want to come be an intern and hang out with me in the prep lab or out in the field, I encourage that. Happy to take any questions. Oh, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry, go ahead. I don't want to call. Um, how long was it to excavate the, um, the horned dinosaur? Taurosaurus, um, sorry. The Taurosaurus, so the one from 2019, we were out there for seven weeks much to the construction company's dismay. <laughs> seven weeks too long for them. So you mentioned that you have to leave the jackets out there for sometimes for a, a long period of time mm -hmm. uh, when you can't get it back to the museum right away. Have you ever had it where you've come back to it and it's been damaged because of the weathering? Or like, I don't know if someone tries to come along and take it at, at any <laughs> given point. Uh, how do you repair that damage or deal with that type of situation? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, so the, the, there have been some of the field jackets that we've had. Um, you're working in a quarry, right? So you're digging a big pit in the ground. And you can imagine that as uh, it rains, it snows, and if you, even if you have the best drainage ditch ever that you've dug into this quarry, it still fills up with water. So there's got definitely been moments where we go collect jackets and they're floppy or flimsy or they need more plaster applied to them because they've just sat saturated in liquid for a year or so. so Yes, we've had you know jackets get floppy and taco, <laughs> essentially. Where we've had to re-jacket them either in the backcountry or when they get back to the field truck. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's tricky, it's tough, but nobody usually messes with those things because they're in such remote areas. There's no way, even if they wanted to try and you know bring something back, they couldn't because oftentimes they're just too big to like throw in your backpack and bring it back to Denver. You know, <laughs> good question. Yeah. 
when you get a call on a construction site to like come and dig something up, are they like obligated to report it? Do they get compensation for the time? Like how does that work logistically? Yeah, good question. So the like the one in 2019 at the senior living facility that was on private land. So because the guy just happened to be a huge dino nerd, he was <laughs> over the moon that he found the dinosaur when they were excavating this. But he had no legal obligation to report any of that. He could have collected all those bones and just said, forget it, you know. Um, so it totally depends on what they're building and who owns the land and um, all of that. Yeah. My question is similar to the last one. Um, how does it work with different land management? Because Utah has you know, a lot of national park land, a lot of forest land, and BLM land, and then also a lot of private land. Mm -hmm. So when you want to go do something, you know, Escalante has national monument land, mm -hmm. and BLM land, mm -hmm. and national forest yes. all in it. So how do you navigate the permits for that? Because, you know, without a permit, you know, all mm -hmm. invertebrate fossils are not fair game. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So uh, what's really maybe a blessing and a curse is that the paleo world is so small that um, we're able to have really great positive relationships usually with the folks that are issuing the permits. So like Alan Titus is the guy that we would go down at the BLM and Grand Staircase and he you know, is able to sign off and say, yes, you can take dinosaur fossils out of here, that's A-OK. -okay. Um, there are some field sites that we work at up in places like North Dakota where it truly looks like a checkerboard. And uh, we have to make sure that if we're on this side of the fence, it's BLM land, we have a permit for that. When I step over here, I'm on Johnny's land and I can't take any fossils from here. So it definitely gets a little sketchier down there. We're up there, rather. Okay, so, um, when you do find a fossil, and to preface this, uh, we went uh, just random family day, mm -hmm. let's do a little dino dig for my little dino nerd here, and she actually found a mammoth too. Cool. So, and we did have it properly identified, but my question is how do you go from randomly finding something <laughs> to, like how do you navigate past that? Like as a, I honestly just expected her to be digging in the dirt, not to actually find something. I you know, have a nice family picnic, she gets to dig around in the dirt, and yeah. hey, we found stuff. What do you do after that? Sure, so are you asking about um, kind of like targeted prospecting versus like randomly walking around and finding things? Is that what you mean, or? Yeah, just, just as a, like, how do you, as a random person, you're just out, uh -huh. whatever you're doing, hiking, camping, family, picnic, and you dig up something. How do you go, like, what do you, what are your next and steps that after that? Got it, okay. You found something, yes. now what? Yes, okay, great, great. So oftentimes it's best to leave those things in the context that you find them in. So if you can, have, if you have a GPS or even, you know, you can often do this on your smartphone. Um, take a point of where it is, take lots of photos, and then get it to someone that uh, is a paleontologist. So you can talk to someone like Randy at the museum here, or Jim Kirkland is here. <laughs> these are folks that, um, it's their job to be able to go out and ID these things and say, oh my goodness, it's a mammoth tooth, and next to that is the jaw, and the jaw and the skull, you know, you, know, you never know what you're going to find out. Um, so I would say document, 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 and then try to leave in place if you can. Right. Unfortunately, I think we have to move on uh, to keep on schedule, but maybe if you're lucky, you can corner some <laughs> 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 <laughs>